like to say thank you, first of all, to your passionate for having this opportunity to share uh, a reflection of the gospel. Uh, the widow's offering. Following Jesus requires a tremendous amount of trust because he often takes us to unexpected places that require new growth, difficult sacrifices, and moving beyond the boundaries of what's familiar and what's comfortable. Consider the two widows in the Sunday's first reading and the gospel reading. How could they give what common sense says they could not afford? Did they know with total certainty that God would take care of their needs? No. So they gave all they had because they were so in love with God that they trusted his love for them. Trust is a sign of love, genuine love, especially when the one we trust is God. We can love others more freely and generously if we trust God to help us through the difficulties that occur when people prove themselves untrustworthy. Our freedom to love others unconditionally is not based upon how safe we are with them. It's based on how safe we are with God. Each widow gave what she could not afford to lose. We cannot afford to love those who will cause us grief and disappointment and feelings of rejection. And yet Jesus tells us to forgive them and do good to them and go the extra mile for them. Sometimes doing good to those who are difficult to love must include tough love, phrase that some of you all may be, we may are familiar with, which asserts boundaries that they are not allowed to cross. Remember what Jesus did until Good Friday. Jesus always walked away from his persecutors. Did he give up on them? Did he stop loving them? Not at all. Following Christ means that we have to watch for and trust God's timing on speaking up versus walking away. Sometimes doing good to those who are difficult to love must include enabling them to reap what they sow so they begin to understand their need to repent. Instead of uh, cleaning up their messages, we have to let them suffer from it. Think about it. Does God clean up our messages before we repent? Usually he won't even do that after we repent. What would we learn if someone else does the damage control? Loving others always include sacrificing ourselves and relying on God to comfort us, heal us, restore us, and bless us. We can trust God for this. Our joy, our jar of whatever we pour out to others for the sake of love will never go empty. Let us be generous with our almsgiving. What is meant by being generous? Generosity pays willingly, and God pays gener generosity with more generously. What does this mean? The first part, generosity pays willingly means that those who are generous are ready to give away readily, promptly, and joyfully. They know that it comes, it costs them it demands an amount of the, the preparation, giving up, sacrifice, but they readily pay this price. They bear the burden of others. God repays generous, generously. God repays generosity generously, more generously. It is evident, it's even clear the meaning 
Those who give generously can rejoice because their giving is not a waste. God takes it into account. He values and appreciates them much and he rewards them much more abundantly than the extent of their giving. This is what it is seen in all three ratings. They impress upon us how meritorious is giving. A generous giving merits an abundant reward. The poor widow in the first reading from 1 Kings 17, chapters 10 to the 16th verse, gives to the prophets, Elijah, so generously the little portion of the meal that she preserves for her and her son. Practically, it was the last meal for them because they had no more except to die. As a result, she was rewarded abundantly. The jar of the meal was not spent and the crews of the oil did not fail. Similarly, the poor widow in the gospel also gives two copper coins to the synagogue treasury. Apparently, it is very little, but it's very big in the sight of God because she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. Her whole living, accordingly, she married the high praises of Jesus and thus his blessings as well. For sure, she would marry God's salvation as well. In the second reading, from the letter to the Hebrews, we have another example of this same culture of giving. And here the example is none other than Jesus himself. Unlike the other high priests, he did not offer various offerings for the atonement of sins. Instead, he offered his own life himself. As the text says, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to bear the sins of many and to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and the fruit of his selfless, selfless giving is the expulsion of sins and salvation. These examples of generous giving should not be mere matters of biblical knowledge or good exaltations Primarily, they should challenge us for an honest self-examination about our own spirit of giving. They should lay bare our frequent tendencies and instances of greed, dishonesty, manipulation, and accumulation. They should seriously put to question our undue craving for an attachment to money and material possessions and very often, even slavery to, to them as well. They should make us ashamed and repent about our lack of sensitivity, generosity, and sharing. They should inspire and induce us to be generous and joyful givers. Let us recall the inspiring words of Paul in 2 Corinthians ninth chapter, the sixth and seventh verse. Verse six, the point is this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Therefore, don't give sparingly, give bountifully, generously. Verse seven, each one must do as he has made up his mind not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Therefore, don't give begrudgingly, give freely and cheerfully. Let our Father in heaven know that you appreciate the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, for the atonement of our sins. Amen.